we have uh, Adam Selkin from Diversified who had a presentation about a large 2110 uh, system which could be uh, basically flown around the world for special events and he's here to talk to us about how that went and lessons learned from that. Okay, so, great. so oh, uh, two things to know about this presentation. Uh, first of all, instead of the minutia of you know, PTB 2110 packets, this is very much about the physical infrastructure. Um, and uh, secondly, um, I didn't actually know I was going to be doing a presentation, so this whole thing is, was put together over lunch, so uh, please forgive me if it's not as polished as uh, some, some of the others. Um, so what this presentation is going to be about is the system that Fox Sports used at, uh, in Doha, Qatar for FIFA, and also used at Super Bowl, Super Bowl and will also be used for Women's World Cup in Australia. So uh, in summer 2021, Fox Sports came to us and said, um, we know we've got these, these three events, in their parlance they call their, their dual events. We've got these three events and we want to build one system which is going to be used to cover all of them. And so uh, if in normal times, this really wouldn't be a big issue. Uh, of course, yeah, we know the, the Olympics, for example, put their systems in shipping containers and they just put them on ships and send them around the world. You know, not a difficult problem or it's a, certainly a problem that has been solved. However, there were two reasons why we couldn't do that. Um, first of all, if you remember back to 2021, outside all of the big ports around the world, there were big shipping uh, containers, you know, ships just sitting out in the ports, not able to get in. And we had visions of sending our system out, it'd be there outside the ports of uh, Doha, and we'd have to send the Somali pirates in to get our stuff. So, okay, that wasn't an option. Other problem was, because FIFA World Cup had been moved from the summertime and was now going to be done in November through to December of 2022, with Super Bowl very, very shortly after that, there simply wouldn't be time to put the system on a ship from Doha, get it back to Phoenix, get it stood up for the Super Bowl. End result was, we needed to have a system that could be put into a cargo plane. So that's what we started thinking about. So this is sort of a, a little map of uh, where things started or where they moved around. So we built the system in Burbank, California. We flew it to Charlotte, North Carolina, where Fox Sports have a facility. Um, that was both to stand up the system, bring operators in, really get it configured, et cetera, and also really just a trial run of, okay, what's gonna happen you know, when we actually put these things on a plane? Because we could have driven it from Burnett Bank to Charlotte, but we purposely put it on a plane to be able to see you know, what would happen. Um, after from Charlotte, it went from Charlotte to, uh, to Doha, Qatar. Uh, it then went from Qatar and went, uh, did the Super Bowl in Phoenix. Right now, it's in a warehouse in Phoenix being made ready, and it's going to be going to Australia and uh, New Zealand. Uh, so this was our very first event, uh, the, uh, the 2022 uh, World Cup. So this, uh, this shows one of the systems in uh, already stood up and running. It's the IBC in, in Doha. It consists of a total of 20 racks. Uh, each rack is 48 RU, um, and as you'll see in a little bit, it's actually there's uh, four separate pallets, each pallet being five racks. There was a, another system. Uh, this only shows part of it, but there was another uh, system of similarly 20 racks. This was in the studio. So in Doha, there were two completely separate sites. Um, I forget what the distance is. There were about a 30-minute drive between the two. One was the studio, which was right on uh, what they call the Corniche, which was their, their, their bay, and that's where they had all of their on-air talent. Uh, the previous slide was the IBC, which is where they, we managed all the signals coming in and out, uh, sent all the signals to uh, Fox Sports facilities in um, Los Angeles and in Tempe, Arizona. 
So we decided to make flyable pallets. One of the uh, one of the main obstacles is that we can't be any more than 64 inches high if they were going to be in the bottom part of a cargo plane. Um, I believe for more money, you can go higher, but it's considerably more money. So that was our first obstacle. Yeah, we can only go 64 inches high. But as you just saw, can I go back on this? Oh, yes. Um, we've actually got 48 RU racks there. So this is what we came up with. We came up with the, with the, foldable, the foldable racks. Uh, this obviously is in our Burbank facility. Uh, the racks are mostly empty. We are trying to figure out what it's going to take to do it. <laughs> now, when we were basically at this stage, I have to admit that we were starting to think, have we made a mistake here? Um, would we have been better off having a whole load of, uh, of a pelican case or, or similar, type, similar type of racks? The problem with those type of, of traveling racks is twofold. First of all, most 2110 gear is basically you know, big computer servers. They're typically, they're deep. And they're typically deeper than really would you know, comfortably fit into, you know, into standard traveling racks. So probably we'd be looking at custom racks anyway. That's obstacle number one. Obstacle number two is floor space. If you've only got, you know, racks and, you know, 64 inches is the maximum height of the crate, but you've also got to take into account isolators, the wooden crate itself. You don't have many RU to play with. That's fine if you've got plenty of floor space. However, um, when we've got some place like the IBC for, for FIFA, you're paying per square foot. Fox Sports already had the largest amount of space uh, you know, at, uh, at the IBC, um, and we really couldn't go any more than that. Um, at the studio, we were even more limited. The studio was actually a very temporary uh, structure. So floor space is an issue. We then thought, well, okay, could we basically put it in, you know, things like traveling cases and have some way of getting, taking one case and stacking it on top of another? Very practical, provided the case is like maybe, you know, 50, 75, you know, pounds with a few beef people, you can lift it on there. But again, then you start limiting how much gear you can put in that, in that upper rack. Um, we even considered like, well, could we make some kind of, you know, almost like a mechanical lift where the, the, the rack that we want like goes into the thing and then we, we wind it up and raise it and push it in. Um, we did really look into all the different options and the, ultimately we decided that this was, going to, uh, this was going to work. Essentially, it is two 24RU racks um, and they are secured with a very strong hinge in the middle. Um, maybe are we out of order? Uh, you know, I'm going to skip over that slide and we'll, we'll come back to, to it. Um, this is just a picture of the, uh, of the crates uh, arriving in downtown uh, Doha where they've got some very, very interesting buildings in the background. Uh, this is on their waterfront uh, and then the studios. Um, this, I, I'm bouncing, I've got to just grab a number of different photos just to get the general idea. This was the, the crate coming in uh, at the IBC. Um, this is a zoomed in version. Uh, let's see, where is, do we have a, uh, which one is my pointer? Oh, there we go. So down here, I hope that you can see that we've got wheels here. So our general idea was that um, we actually had isolators which could slot into these same positions. So during travel, we would have isolators. At the point where we got it here, we took it off the truck, put it onto a forklift, Ray kept it raised up enough where we could remove the isolator assemblies and slide wheels in instead. So the wheels and the isolators both had these large plates that slid into slots at this, at, on this base. 
and so we could switch out whether we have isolators for traveling or wheels when we wanted to move it from the loading dock into, into this room. Um, this happens to be in, uh, the, in the Charlotte facility, but it just shows uh, a, just a general view. So you can see pallet one, pallet two, pallet three, pallet four. This is one of the systems. And then back here, you can see there's another four systems, or no, four, another four pallets, which was the studio, one IBC, one studio. Okay, and then this is a, a video of the guys, uh, you know, bringing it up. Uh, now, here is a, is there's a pulley, and then down here, unfortunately not that visible, oh, you can just about see it here, is, um, uh, is like, a, a, like a winch system running, and that is basically helping us pull it up. And the winch was easily capable, you know, of pulling, you know, 200, 300 pounds, um, we never got, I think, I think that the, the heaviest unit at the top was probably something around about 100 pounds, maybe 120, something like that. Obviously, the tricky part was at the point when it went past the tipping point, and then, of course, that is why you might be able to see, and I've got another video coming up where you can see a little bit clearly, there's guys at the back basically holding on with a, uh, with a, a, a strap sort of back here, keeping the whole thing from tipping over. Um, there's a reasonable amount number of guys hanging around here. This was probably one of the, our first goes around. Um, we got it to the point where we could do the whole thing with, uh, I think we ended up with just... Uh, Four guys could, could do each, each unit, two at the front and two at the back. Um, this system here, this uh, unistrut here, essentially is an H shape. Um, it, uh, it just clicks in to the base here. Here there's pads and simply just the weight of it pushes against, against this. Um, you just saw that piece here, that was a very useful a uh, little thing, it was sort of like a, uh, like a little Pac-Man, uh, but was magnetic, clipped into place magnetically, and that made the, this, uh, um, this cable here, it meant sure that that cable didn't go and scrape and, uh, on the bottom uh, of, of the rack. Um, that, was, that was something that we came up with after we didn't have that in the, in the Burbank to Charlotte move, and we realized it was something that we needed. And then the next one here, um, are you at the back, sorry, the media person, are you able to start the, the video going? Thank you. So this is a time lapse of the IBC of the whole system being stood up. Um, this is a time lapse. It is somewhere between four and a half and five hours to stand everything up, and that includes cabling everything together. Um, you'll see in a moment, once they've done this, they slide everything in. Right now, the guys are going and putting in the locking plate, so there's locking plates, so once they're up, they can't go and be pushed down again. And then uh, MPOs were strung between them. Um, the other reason why I should mention, I didn't mention before, but the other reason why we thought that this ended up being better than just having a whole load of, uh, of traveling cases is that it meant that any cables running within a particular pallet, within a particular group of five racks, we could just run underneath the racks. And so we didn't have to have more cabling between them. We ended up using, I think, round about, I want to say, 24 to 26 MPO 12 cables to link everything together. Um, and we did consider using MPO 24s, which of course would reduce it even more. Problem is, if you're in Doha, Qatar, you can't just go down and get another MPO 24 very easily. Um, Amazon doesn't ship there. Uh, even, even shipping from other places is, is difficult. So we wanted something that we at MPO 12s, much easily, more easily, if we needed to get, to get more. Um, and so that was another reason why this pallet system ended up working, reducing the, uh, the number of fibers. Um, 
So uh, let's see. The only other thing I mention is you can see we had to do one unusual thing. You can actually see the cable bundles here, which like link the top and the bottom um, racks. Um, obviously, originally we thought, oh, we're just going to have those cable bundles going inside. The problem, of course, there is that when they then close up, those cable bundles are then on the top side and potentially able to be damaged. By doing it this way, when they're in the collapsed mode, those cable bundles are inside. Um, so it ended up, say, with a system where we could physically get it up and running uh, from an empty room to fully functioning in, a, in about five hours. Um, and that was extremely helpful when we had to go from the end of Doha. Doha, last game was the 18th. I think they had a wrap-up show on the 19th, followed by pushing all of the, getting all their content, you know, uh, sent. I think we started collapsing the system about December the 20th, and it was flying to Phoenix, I think, about the, the 23rd, something like that. Basically, everyone was, was home for Christmas which was a, a nice thing. Um, and then when we got to Phoenix, again, it was stood up very quickly. So that's the uh, end of presentation. Uh, anybody, any, any questions on it? Thanks. Yeah, very, very interesting. Uh, I noticed you had some quite fragile switches uh, and some reasonably fragile looking hardware. How did, obviously this hardware isn't really designed to be flown around unboxed, or is that, is that fair to say? How, how did you get on with that? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so, yeah, it, it, was, it was designed, everything was designed to be flown around in the equipment racks. Okay. Um, we did originally think, oh, that all of the equipment in the upper racks we originally designed it, okay, we're going to take it out, put it in the boxes, and ship separately. Because, of course, one of the problems is in the upper rack, when you fold it over, now everything is traveling upside down. Yeah. Um, we did, we were concerned about that, um, but we actually found that most equipment is fine like that. We did run into one issue, the main problem being is, in most servers, the heavy piece of gear are DC to DC converters. And if they're just fixed onto the PCB by their pins, then, and they have enough vibration, yeah. they're going to have a problem. Um, we actually had to go in and actually get a little bit of CA glue and actually glue some of them. Um, but we ended up, we put isolators in. In fact, let me, if I go back um, and we can possibly, oh yes, so here, um, I'm sorry, uh, let me find the one with the isolators. Um, yeah, I don't know how well this is, uh, this is clear, but, um, but, but here there are, on the corners, there's a heavy-duty isolator okay. at each corner. So right down at the bottom is a special pallet which is provided by the airlines. I, I ended up learning a lot about airline shipping. And there's special pallets which are approved for cargo transport from the airline. Um, and we came up with a bracketry system that would clamp the isolators onto the, these L rails which run around the outside of this, uh, of this pallet. We put uh, shock measurements into the, um, into, into the racks, you know, and we didn't really see, you know, even the, we actually found there was more shock just traveling down the road than there was anywhere, anywhere else. And we didn't see any shocks any more than there would be if it was just being shipped in a box. Very interesting. Of course, maybe Southwest Airlines or Spirit Airlines weren't flying the airplanes. They, as, a, <laughs> as a pilot, they have a particular reputation for their approach to landings. So, but anyway, yeah, very interesting. Any other questions? No? All right, thank you so much. Appreciate you sharing that. Thank you.